going to talk about Cantor's theorem. First, let's give a quick recap of where we were in our last lesson. In everything we do today, let's say that f and g are continuous functions and i is a closed interval from a to b. First, the sum of two continuous functions, f plus g, is also a continuous function. Next, the product of two continuous functions, f times g, is also a continuous function. Third, let's consider the collection of all continuous functions from i to f. We'll denote this by the symbol c superscript 0 i comma f. Then this collection is a commutative ring. Next, any polynomial is a continuous function. If you recall, we proved this using the by induction on the degree n. And finally, there is an example of a function that is discontinuous everywhere. This was an example generated by Dirichlet. It says, let's consider that function where f of x is 1 whenever x is rational and 0 whenever x is irrational. Then this function is discontinuous for every real number p. Today we're going to move in a completely different direction, but still using this concept of sequences and series that we've been discussing all along. We're motivated by two very simple questions. First, what is a set? And second, how do we determine how large a set is? Well, let's start with some rather simple examples. We can consider perhaps the empty set, the set consisting of just one element or two elements, or even three elements. Now let's consider the power set of these sets. The power set, denoted by script P of A, is the collection of subsets of our set. Well, if A is the empty set, it only has one subset, namely itself. So we'll let P of A be the set consisting of the empty set. This only has one element, namely the empty set itself. Let's say that A, perhaps, is a singleton set. That is, it's a set that consists of just one element. Then there are only two subsets of A, namely the set consisting of no elements or the set consisting of one element. This will be both the empty set and A itself. In this case, P of A just consists of two elements, the empty set and A itself. Third, let's say maybe that A is the set consisting of two elements, P and Q. Then the power set consists of those subsets that have no element, one element, or two elements. In this case, there are just four possibilities. Either that subset is the empty set, the subset is the singleton set consisting of P, the singleton set consisting of Q, or that set consisting of both elements P and Q. In this case, there are only four subsets of A. So the power set consists of four elements. Notice that in all of these cases, A is a subset of itself. So A is an element of the power set of A. However, in these examples, we do not have A is an element of A, only that A is a subset. Note that we can actually consider sequences to be in correspondence with the natural numbers. That is, if we have a natural number n, we can simply correspond that to an element a sub n. What we'd like to know is, how does the power set of the natural numbers compare to the natural numbers itself, or even compare to the collection of real numbers? We're going to discuss a series of ideas introduced by the German mathematician Georg Ferdinand Philipp Cantor. As we mentioned before, the power set, P of A, is just a collection of subsets of A. You can actually see by induction, which we actually have done in a previous homework set, that the power set of A is 2 to the n, where n is the number of elements of A. And so, the number of elements of A is always strictly less than the number of elements in the power set of A. Cantor actually proved that this is even true when A is not a finite set. Simply put, for any set A, not just the ones that are finite, the set of subsets of A has strictly greater cardinality than A itself. 
we're going to proceed by contradiction for this statement. First, let's try to explain what do we mean by cardinality. Of course, by contradiction, we're going to assume that both A and its power set, P of A, have the same cardinality. This means that there is a one-to-one -one map between A and the power set of A. This map, whatever it is, will assign an element lowercase a in our set capital A, a subset f of lowercase a contained in capital A. Again, an element lowercase a will be assigned to a subset f of lowercase a. Now, assuming that we do have such a one-to-one -one map f, let's consider the following subset of capital A. This will be the collection of elements lowercase a and capital A, such that lowercase a is not contained in the set f of lowercase a. Even though b here is, by construction, a subset of a, therefore it is in the power set of a, we're actually going to prove that b must not be in the image of our one-to-one -one map f. Of course, because we want to show that we have a contradiction, let's assume otherwise. This means that b is f of lowercase a for some element lowercase a in our set capital A. We have two possibilities to consider. Either lowercase a is in the set capital B, or lowercase a is not in the set capital B. Let's consider the first case, assuming lowercase a is an element of capital B. Well, because capital B is f of lowercase a, then this means that a is an element of lowercase of f of lowercase a. But from the way that we've constructed b, we actually see that a is not an element of f of lowercase a. So we find a contradiction. Let's assume the other case, that lowercase a is not an element of b then this means lowercase a is not an element of f of lowercase a. But again, by the construction of b, we see that a is an element of capital B. This is again a contradiction. Simply put, this type of argument is called a diagonal argument, and we'll see this over and over again throughout today's discussion. Let's give an application of this result, although Historically, Kant should actually prove this before he proved the previous statement. We claim that the collection of all real numbers is an uncountable set. That is, the cardinality of the real numbers is strictly greater than the cardinality of the natural numbers. We're going to prove that there is a one-to-one -one map between the real numbers and the power set of the natural numbers. Recall that the previous statement of Cantor says that there are more power sets of n than there are natural numbers in n. That is, since there is no one-to-one -one map from the natural numbers to the power set of the natural numbers, there cannot be a one-to-one -one map from the natural numbers to the real numbers. But this is, by definition, what it means to be uncountable. We're going to construct our map very carefully, going from the real numbers to the power set of the natural numbers. First, let's observe that there is a one-to-one -one map from the real numbers to the open interval from zero to one. The way that we'll do this is we'll first take a real number x and we'll consider y, which is e to the x divided by one plus e to the x. Conversely, given a number y between zero and one, we can consider the log of y divided by one minus y, which gives us a real number x. So we do indeed have a one-to-one -one map here. The idea is that the real numbers is a large infinite set that's hard for us to understand, so instead we'll consider a small interval from zero to one, which we can understand a little bit better. Second, let's observe that there is a one-to-one -one map from this open interval to the collection of sequences of zeros and ones. For example, let's take the element one half. One half we can think of as the sequence one, zero, 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 zero. One fourth we can think of as the sequence zero, one, zero, 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 zero. We can continue in this way to say take any number between zero and one and let's write it base two. This means we can write it as a sub one divided by two 
plus a sub 2 divided by 4 plus a sub 3 divided by 8, and so on. The numerators, the a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, will all be numbers that are equal to either 0 or 1. Again, all that we're doing here is taking the number y between 0 and 1 and expressing it base 2. We can see that we can do this in a one-to-one -one way. Although as a caveat, this is not quite one-to-one -one as stated, one must modify this slightly, and we recommend that you go to the Wikipedia page to see exactly what the subtlety is here. But we won't worry about this very much for today's lesson. Finally, let's observe that there is a one-to-one -one map from the collection of sequences of zeros and ones to the power set of the natural numbers. We'll construct everything as follows. First, let's, contain, let's consider a sequence of zeros and ones. Maybe the sequence looks something like this, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. In this case, we see, for example, that a sub 2 equals 1, but everything else is 0. By looking at that subscript 2, we'll form the singleton set consisting of just the number 2. Working in the opposite way, let's say maybe we have a subset that consists of maybe 1, 2, and 5. In this case, we'll construct a sequence of zeros and ones by looking at a sub 1, a sub 2, and a sub 5. All of the other a sub n's will set to be 0, and those three will set to be 1. So our sequence now looks like this. Starting with a subset capital A, which is maybe 1, 2, and 5, we'll construct a sequence such that a sub 1 is 1, a sub 2 is 1, a sub 3 and a sub 4 are 0, a sub 5 is 1, and all of the other a sub n's will be 0. So in this way, we can construct now a subset of the natural numbers, capital A, by considering any sequence of zeros and ones. This is a one-to-one -one correspondence. Putting all of these together, we now see that we actually do have a one-to-one -one map that takes a real number x, returns an element y between 0 and 1, writes down a sequence of zeros and ones, the a sub n, and will return a subset of the natural numbers, capital A. This is our desired one-to-one -one map. Again, this is what's typically called the diagonal argument. We won't go over this today, but one can see from this diagram that really the way that Cantor originally thought of this was by taking a look at a sequence of zeros and ones. And somehow by looking at the diagonal here that you see in red, he could then construct an element that does not appear in the sequence. Namely, you take the zeros, you swap those with ones, and you take the ones and swap those with zeros. So here, as Cantor argued, you actually have a construction by the diagonal of a sequence S of zeros and ones that does not appear anywhere in the sequences that you see up above. We're going to use this now to, concept, to discuss the concept of infinity. Something strange really is going on here because we see that we have the natural numbers, the power set of the natural numbers, which roughly speaking looks like the real numbers, so now we can discuss the idea of infinities. Any set S for which there is a surjective map from the natural numbers to S is said to be countable. For example, when S only has a finite number of elements, then there is a surjective map from S, F, from the natural numbers, to S. Otherwise, we'll know that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence when S is infinite. In this case, we simply say that the cardinality of s is the symbol denoted as aleph naught. One thing we're going to see in the work in the breakout group problems are that both the integers and the rational numbers are countable sets. This means that the sides of the natural numbers, which you'll recall we called aleph naught, is the same as the size of the integers, is the same as the size of the rational numbers. Yes, this does look strange because even though everything here is infinite, the whole concept of a of naught is that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the natural numbers and the integers and the rational numbers. 
we've actually seen that the power set of the natural numbers has strictly more elements than the natural numbers itself. And in fact, Cantor's argument shows that the real numbers has the same number of elements as the power set of the natural numbers. So we see actually the real numbers is an uncountable set. In this case, because we're dealing with the power set, we'll say that the cardinality of the real numbers is just the cardinality of the power set of the natural numbers, which we call Aleph 1. The continuum hypothesis conjectures that there is no set whose cardinality is strictly greater than Aleph naught, that is, it is uncountable, but strictly less than Aleph 1, that is, has fewer elements than the real numbers. Putting all of this together, we actually see that there are different levels of infinity. Indeed, we've started with the natural numbers, which is cardinality Aleph naught. We consider now the power set of the natural numbers, namely the real numbers, which is cardinality Aleph 1. We can even consider the power set of the power set of the natural numbers, which has even more elements than the real numbers. In fact, we see that this is another size of infinity, and its size we can denote by Aleph 2. More generally, we can actually define Aleph sub n plus 1 as the size of the power set of any set that has cardinality Aleph sub n. So yes, there are infinitely different levels of infinity. Bertrand Russell, the English mathematician, was really interested in all of these concepts of infinity and even more basically by looking at the concept of a set. In fact, we're going to discuss a proof here of a statement which looks very similar to Cantor's diagonal argument. Bertrand Russell was really interested in this concept of sets and actually found a very deep statement. The naive version of set theory that we're interested in actually cannot exist. Here's how his argument went. Let's let X be the set of all sets. And notice that we're not formally defining a set. Let's just try to think intuitively perhaps what a set should be. Using this idea, let's consider the following set. This will be the set of sets A, where A is not an element of itself. Again, we're collecting together all of the sets, capital A, where A is not an element of itself. There are many such sets in this way. For example, A could be the empty set. The empty set is certainly a set that has no elements, so the empty set cannot be an element of itself. But we're going to form the set B, which is the collection of all such possible sets A. We have two cases to consider. Either B is an element of itself, or B is not. And we won't do this today, but if you stare at this either case, you will actually run into a contradiction. This actually shows that one cannot consider the set of all sets. This is really too big and it's too naive. In fact, there is a standard axiomization of set theory. These are actually inside of a branch of math called category theory. There is the idea that you can make a set defined in a rigorous way so that you can actually do as much mathematics as you'd like to do. But you may be interested to note that in most math books, it will never define what a set is. We're going to end things today with some ideas based off of another English mathematician named Alan Turing. He was very interested in some of the concepts of Bertrand Russell by looking at some of the proofs he had in terms of sets. But Turing was actually motivated by a couple of different questions. First, he really wanted to know what exactly is a computer and what are some limits on what a computer can do. Curiously, he found answers by focusing on Cantor's original diagonal argument, which Russell used, if you notice, to discuss properties of sets. We're going to discuss this first question, what is a computer, by writing things in a very rigorous way. We'll say that a computer is a machine that contains programs, which we'll denote by P, such that if we have an input I, it will yield an output P of I. We can actually make a slightly more theoretical framework for a computer. 
There are basically two parts. First, there should be a tape. Nowadays, you can think of this perhaps as a hard drive. This tape will have infinite length, consisting of individual cells, similar to the idea of sectors today, and each cell will contain exactly one symbol, I. Second, there is a head, which can read or write one cell of a tape at a time. It can also move the tape from the left or to the right. The head contains an instruction P, remember a program, to create a new symbol I. So the idea is that it will read a symbol I and perhaps replace that with the new symbol P of I. Here's a diagram so that you can see how this works. Notice that you have a tape, which for all intents and purposes will be of infinite length, and inside of this tape, at every cell, we have a symbol. The symbols could be X1, X2, maybe B. We also have a head, which you see can move to the left or to the right, and it can either read or write into this cell. Turing first described such a device in 1836, calling it an automatic machine and later a logical computing machine. What he wrote of this device is exactly what we described above that it should have an infinite memory, he wasn't really concerned with memory storage, and also that it can read and write one symbol at a time. Nowadays, we call this simplified idea of a computer a Turing machine. Turing himself was interested in the limits of computation. In fact, he himself considered the following halting problem. Let's say that P is a program and I is any input. Can we decide whether the program P of I will finish running or will it eventually continue to run forever? Actually, it was Martin Davis who introduced the phrase halting problem in 1958. But let's make this a little bit more precise. We're going to consider a program that we'll call halt that takes as its input two elements, namely a program I and an input, a program P and an input I and it will return true if the program will stop after a finite amount of time or false if the program will continue to run forever. Again, we're looking at this program halt that will decide whether a program will either stop after a finite number of time or continue running forever. Curiously, Turing showed that such a program cannot exist. That is, his famous theorem says, a general algorithm to solve the halting program for all possible program input pairs cannot exist. Before we discuss the proof, let's maybe talk about a few examples to try to exemplify what did Turing mean by all of this. First, let's consider a program P that adds the numbers from 0 to I. P of I will eventually finish running. Think of this as if i is equal to 10, we're simply going to sum the integers 0, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, all the way up through plus 10. We know that after a finite amount of time, this program will stop. Hence, halt p comma i is true. Next, let's consider that program that will take a document i and will search for the word mathematician. Think of this as perhaps you have an email and you're simply searching and looking for one word. Well, since of course the email has a finite amount of text, this program will finish running after a finite amount of time. So that means halt p comma i will again be true. Third, let's consider a loop that does the following. Let's start with n is equal to one. Let's now add one to that to get back one. Let's add another one to get two. Let's add another one to get three, and let's continue adding one in this way. In this way, P of I will continue to run forever. There will no way that this program will stop adding one to an integer over and over again. So in this case, halt P comma I is false. The program will run forever. Now we'd like to try to prove Turing's theorem. Let's consider the following program. Here, we've written the program in Python pseudocode, but we'll try to explain roughly what this says. As our input, we'll take a program P. And once we have our program, we can input P into the program, and now we're simply going to ask a question. 
if once we input the P into our program P, things terminate after a finite number of time, this program trouble will just keep running itself infinitely long. The program itself will never return an answer. However, if halt of P P, that is P evaluated at P, runs on forever, then the program here will return false. Sorry, the program here will return true. That's because the program was run forever. So trouble is a rather strange function. If the program P evaluated at P will run forever, trouble will return true. And if otherwise the program stops after a finite number of time, trouble itself will run for an infinite time. So simply put, trouble determines whether P or P will run forever. It will return true if P or P does run forever, and itself will just run forever if P or P does not. Now, I claim by proof of contradiction that halt trouble trouble cannot be computed. Now we're going to actually try to take a look at whether trouble itself terminates after a finite amount of time. Well, let's assume, by way of contradiction, that this can be computed. That is, we'd like to know whether trouble, evaluated trouble, stops after a finite amount of time. For the moment, let's say that trouble trouble is true. That means that trouble evaluated a trouble will stop after a finite amount of time. This is what the halting program says. However, by looking at the definition of trouble, Remember that trouble itself only returns true if the program actually runs and doesn't stop. So we find a contradiction. If halt trouble trouble is true, then by the definition of our program, halt trouble trouble must be false. On the other hand, let's say that halt trouble trouble is false. This means from the definition of the halt program, trouble evaluated trouble will continue to run forever. But from the way that the trouble program works, remember that if halt trouble trouble is false, then the trouble program evaluated trouble will stop after a finite amount of time. Hence, halt trouble trouble will be true. So again, this is a contradiction. We conclude that no matter what, halt cannot be computed with this program P is trouble and the input I is trouble. This is a little bit disturbing, but this does say that actually there are computer programs that cannot be written and they cannot be computed. Thanks for watching.